Welcome. Welcome, everybody, to the Wednesday afternoon discussion at the Steel Center. And today we have uh, Dr. Nathan Dickman of the University of the Ozarks down the street in mm -hmm. Clarksville. So, um, Nathan, Eric, go by Eric, right? Yeah, but Dr. Dickman. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's a uh, focus is mostly on theories of interpretation and works at sometimes the intersection between philosophy and religious studies yeah. is interested in theories of questioning and how questioning is involved in religious thinking, philosophical thinking, and has just published this book on interpretation. So people who are um, involved in a practice called hermeneutics Hermeneutics is the study of interpretation. Is that right? That's how I would say it, sure. Study of interpretation or kind of inquiry into what interpretation is and how it serves us. Um, and as far as like the historical philosophy, you spend a lot of time with Paul Ricoeur, right? Yeah, and Gadamer. And Gadamer, two philosophers that tend to focus on hermeneutics. Um, and today, Dr. Dickman's going to be talking about a hermeneutic approach. Plato's cave. So um, let's give him a warm welcome. welcome to you know, thank you so much for having me again, and I really appreciate this. Uh, uh, I really admire that you guys have this uh, uh, Steel Center Wednesday event, and I'm jealous uh, that I think I might steal your idea <laughs> if I could. If I could, but small campuses are so busy; it's hard to get people to. Anyway, all right. This isn't a complaint. Uh, so, so I'm really grateful to be here to talk about this. I've been experimenting with this for like almost 10 years now, uh, uh, but, but in teaching the entirety of the Republic in introduction to philosophy classes, uh, I started to notice this pattern and I've grown more and more suspicious of the pattern to the point where I feel like I need to start saying something. And the pattern is reflected in t-shirts like this. So what I want to try to convince you of today is that if you use a hermeneutic approach, like the one I will suggest, we might actually come to a different conclusion about the cave than that. Uh, maybe the point of Plato's cave is not to escape it, but to be in it better. Um, it seems that with t-shirts like this, the message is that we're supposed to liberate ourselves from the cave or be liberated from the cave. And the goal would be to like never return to the cave if we could. Uh, but for some reason, some of us have to go back down. Some of us get murdered when we do. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the cave, we are gonna talk about it a little bit and I'll give you the story in a second. Um, the way I think I wanna do this is first try to give like an overview of how people talk about the cave today. Then I'm gonna try to explain like the hermeneutic method that I wanna use to try to examine it. And then actually try to examine it using that method and see if it comes to a result that is different from what we're, I wanna say, you know, this is the popularized version. This is what we're being indoctrinated into. So, how can we resist being indoctrinated? I don't know that I have another interpretation that I want to promote as much as I want to resist, help us resist what I want, I'm going to call, and I think I said it in the flyer too, the, the bootstrap and rescue reading. When I say bootstrap, I, I'm referring to that phrase, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Have you ever heard of this? What does that mean? If somebody were to say, pick yourself up by your, it's basically saying your poverty is your own fault. And if you just put the work in, you as an individual would be able to overcome your marginalization, systematic oppression, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And we know through things like critical race theory, um, other analyses of systems of oppression, that it's not really individuals that we are all kind of populations that are being affected by systems. And so uh, the focus on individualism ends up corrupting our ability to read. And, and really just, I want us to be able to read the book right, without telling the book what it's saying. 
how can we read it without telling it what it's saying? Okay, so um, does anybody want to try summarizing the cave who has heard, it, heard of it before? Has anybody read the whole Republic besides the guy? All right, you? Okay. okay. So let, let's let's do this. Okay, so let, let me give it's you an overview. So there's this book by Plato, whose real name is Aristophanes. Plato is his nickname. It means broad, and I think that's a euphemism, but other people think it's because he's a wrestler. Um, so, and I say that to make us go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. So, so the Republic is Socrates is in conversation with a whole bunch of people, and let's see if I can come up with the list of names. Should be here. The dramatic personae. Where's this at? No, they left it out of this edition. Okay, so so this guy Socrates is walking around, and all of a sudden, people grab him and say, "Hey, come to our party!" And he shows up at the party. There's this older gentleman named Cephalus who's saying, and Socrates is like, "You know, I like speaking with elderly people. Could you tell me what the good life is like?" And Cephalus says, "Be just." And then all of a sudden, Socrates is like, now I'm in the mood for philosophy. What is justice? And the rest of the book is trying to figure that out with the different conversation partners. The main important conversation partners are Glaucon and Adimantus. These are uh, Plato's brothers. Uh, but Plato actually is not one of the characters in the dialogue. So we have Plato writing the dialogue, Socrates as the first person narrator, who is describing his dialogue with Adimantus and Lacan, and then some other people that, if you want to read the whole Republic, great. If you don't, that's fine. So they keep talking about what is justice, and eventually they get to this question of uh, what constitutes philosophically informed knowledge, um, philosophical insight, and he creates these models, the divided line, which says, you know, you can only, like, do you only know fantasies? Do you know things? Do you know ideas? Or do you know the first principle? Um, and then he gives an analogy of the sun to try to say that just like the sun reflects light on items so that we can see them, the idea of the good reflects intelligibility on idea, or let's say complete thought reflects intelligibility on complete thoughts so that we can think them or understand, okay? And then right after that, they go into this cave uh, story. Um, so, so uh, and Socrates is mainly speaking with Glaucon at this point. And Glaucon and Adiamantus are Plato's brothers, which I already mentioned, but some other things that I want you to know about them is that they're both soldiers, decorated soldiers, <laughs> And both of them have kind of aspirations for political leadership of some sort. And that's going to matter once we start looking at the, the text itself. Um, is there any other setup stuff that would be crucial? Good enough. Okay, so let's, let's actually look at the cave. So there's all these t-shirts. Uh, if you don't like this one, there's the vintage one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, apparently, uh, we're supposed to rescue people from the cave. That's what we're being taught by the t-shirt, right? Uh, but let's look at different models of the cave. The, I just grabbed a whole bunch of memes off of Facebook and what is it, the internet? Is that what it's called? <laughs> uh, so apparently, there are people who are chained inside the cave, mainly people who can be manipulated by uh, apparently this person thought it's the media that manipulates us, but we could say Democrats, Republicans, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And getting out of the cave is waking up, you know, awake, basically, is, are we Buddhists? Like, okay, and maybe you don't get that. Um, then you wake up and you love life outside, and I don't see any more to the story there. Um, let's look at another one, see how people put it to use. Oh, uh, this must be from a Republican, because apparently the Democrats are the ones who are manipulated. Again, it's the media that manipulates you, the puppet masters. And if you really want to be free, like a good old conservative Republican, you know, ban books, all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, again, voters are manipulated. Uh, ooh, played up some babies. That's cool, right? It's good to be in the cave. Party time. This one's interesting to me because religious people are being manipulated by ministers, priests, whatever, monks, whatever, right? You see it? And that, you know, if you really want to be a free thinking atheist, you got to escape the cave, right? The goal is to be an atheist. Being a religious means you're just manipulated by people. Uh, I don't know what this one is. Forms of outside the cave. Is this somebody who's really trying to? What I like about this one is I think this one. This version of the cave is closer to what I think uh, Plato's description is in the text. And the reason why I think this matters is because of this pathway. Uh, is this pathway merely a place for people to manipulate others? Or are they just people walking by a fire that's a trail on like a longer road? Uh, so this one suggests that it's more like people are walking by, whereas these other ones are like clearly labeling them manipulators. This one's interesting because it was about COVID and being, right? There's no such thing as COVID. You're living in the shadows. If you take it seriously, you're a prisoner to the media or whatever that's manipulating. Ooh, apparently somebody put it on a tattoo on their arm. Hopefully they got the interpretation correct. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so again, this is the one that I think is probably uh, accurate, whatever. There, there actually is research from the early 1900s where somebody looked at caves in Greece that they thought, they, and they found a cave that they thought they had evidence that Plato probably visited it and probably was inspired by this cave. And I don't have the picture right now because apparently I didn't care enough to find it for it. Sorry. <laughs> But, but that does exist if you are interested in like the facts about the cave and we'll come back to it at that. Let's see, anything else? No. So the next thing is assuming that most people have not read the Republic, right? So it's it's a hundred, no, how many pages is it? 500 pages. Well, take 200 off for Bloom. So 300 pages. Uh, when people have tried to estimate how long it would take to perform it, like a theatrical performance, it's about a nine hour conversation. Have you ever, what's the longest conversation you've ever had? Probably 24 hours. Really? Nonstop, 24 hours, no sleep, constant talking, no pee breaks? <laughs> um, yeah, for that, in the last a, year. Yeah, that's long. amazing. Good for you. It was oh. really fun. You have totally undermined the point I was trying to make because, because I was going to say it, that's you, fantastic. Yeah, it was I really, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Seen. And yeah, I'm not trying to demean you. <laughs> uh, for me to to have the resources, the free time, the leisure to be able to pull off a nine hour conversation, you, I mean, you've got to have that much free time, right? Like, again, I'm trying to talk about the people like Glaucon and Eddie Mantis to suggest they're part of a privileged class of people, okay? Uh, and we'll come back to that. Yeah. I keep saying, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, I want to go all the way to the cave passage. Five seventeen is the real line that I care about. 37. So what I'm going to do now is just show you where it shows up. I explained where it is in the narrative. But what I want to do is show the video so that you can see like kind of a summary. Let's see. Here it is. So this is from 8-Bit Philosophy, but the same caricature of the cave narrative. And I keep saying narrative on purpose. I'm not sure what word to use, but there's a word that I don't want to use that they happen to use here called allegory. And I don't want us to think in terms of allegory because Socrates doesn't use the word allegory. So why do we call it an allegory uh, if Socrates doesn't call it that? We're taught to call it an allegory. So now we're, yeah, an allegory means that there's correspondences to from one thing to another. So the cave is supposed to allegorize some other thing. And so already calling it an allegory finds us to look for, ooh, how does this parallel this? And maybe there are parallels, but that's not how Socrates introduces it. Um, but if you look at 8-bit philosophy or wisecrack, if you look at school of life, if you look at 
um, even the TED Ed series, it, most videos that are talking about Plato's Cave describe it in this way. 8-bit is the easiest example. Uh, they're, they're the easiest to bully. Okay. So here's Plato's Cave. Let's just watch the whole thing. It's only three minutes. Ponder this, my friends. If you were born inside of a box with the thought of a world outside it, a world that is more real, ever enter your mind. Considered one of philosophy's greatest writers, Plato asked just this sort of question in his famous Allegory of the Cave. Imagine a group of people born into a cave, chained by their legs and necks facing the back wall. The only thing they can see are shadows cast by a fire behind them. And since they've never seen the actual objects, they think the shadows are real. But what would happen if one of the prisoners were to be set free? When he turns round and sees the objects, will he know that the shadows are a lesser copy of reality? And when he eventually leaves the cave and sees the sun and nature for the first time, would his mind not be completely blown? But wait a sec. If the objects are more real than the shadows, how do we know there isn't something more real than the objects? The ultimate reality is what Plato calls the realm of the forms. It is eternal, unchangeable, it is the realm of being, of what is. Our world, on the other hand, is the world of becoming, of change and what we perceive, where everything is constantly becoming something else. Just as the shadow of an object is a faded copy of the actual object, the world as we perceive it consists of imperfect copies of the forms. After experiencing a higher truth, what would happen if the prisoner returned to the cave? Plato muses that telling the others of the greater reality would threaten their narrow beliefs. If they could, they might even kill him. <laughs> All right, let's just leave it there. Okay. So it seems that the whole point of the cave is that uh, we're stuck in the shadows. Um, so somebody sets us free and we happily go outside and realize the truth. When we come back down, our goal is to try to convince the other people that they're living in lies and the shadows and that our goal is to try to liberate them. But instead, what do they do? Right. So let's just start there. Let's start there. Who do they kill? So this is, the, this is the passage. It lasts for about two or three pages. And so what we're going to do is look at the text. But before we look at the text, let me, um, let me explain uh, the hermeneutic approach that I'm taking. Uh, it's all about reading texts. So what I've, and I've worked with uh, uh, children's literacy, like uh, how to teach kids how to read, because, you know, like some of us, aren't that good a reader. So how do we improve? So, um, and the model I use starts with, we need to figure out the questions about what's on the lines of the text, questions, and then once we settle that, then we move to questions about what's between the lines of text. This is for ambiguous questions with ambiguous answers where it's not clear what's on the lines. Uh, for example, in the beginning of the, the Torah, we've got, um, you know, uh, this God is creating the universe, like says it's good, you know, says, uses the God's voice to try to separate things, okay? And then just a passage later, walking around the garden, the God's like, hey, where'd you go? So how do you fit the line of the God asking question with the line of the God being like all-knowing creator of the universe? It's ambiguous. How are you going to answer that? The answer is not on the lines. Is that just a rhetorical question? Didn't really mean it? Well, why do you want a God that like doesn't say the truth? <laughs> I know where you are. Stop doing that. 
right? Okay, so you just explain that part of on the lines away. So there's on the lines, there's between the lines, there's behind the lines where we look at the historical context, the author's intent. Um, even we could talk about the material production of the, the, the physical copy of the book. Uh, and then beyond the lines is where I'm trying to invite us as readers to go, how is this text affecting us? So on the lines, between the lines, behind the lines, and that's kind of the exegetical hermeneutic circle. And then what we can call the existential hermeneutic circle is when it's going beyond the lines. What does this have to do with us? Like not just what is Plato saying, but what is Plato saying to me? That's the added line. Okay. So let's start with on the lines. And I want to prove to you that the, the uh, video has not even read what's on the lines. That the video has made up a totally different story that's not Plato's case. But my critique of this video applies to lots of histories of commentaries on the cave of scholarship that's actually published. Heidegger. Anas has an analytic approach. We've got political philosophers that have written on the cave that repeat more or less the same story. So when I'm talking about the video, know that I'm also kind of shitting on other philosophers. And I don't want to, I don't mean to, I just want to read the book well. Okay, so let's look at the last lines here. Um, if once he had to compete, wait, compete, where did that come from? Where's the competition? That wasn't in the video. So already we're confused between what's going on in the cave and what's going on in Plato's book. Uh, so he, he comes back to the cave. Uh, his eyes aren't recovered. They think he's laughable. The person who's returned, what they do to that person is they laugh at him. That's not, I'm, I don't kill people that make me laugh. Some of you are like, you have no idea. <laughs> um, and then let's look more carefully here. And, and look, translations don't line up. There are other translations that make it a little more ambiguous. I'm deliberately picking a translation that confirms my bias. Okay. So well, that's uh, why I have, I have the Taylor one. It's, it says, uh, if we had to compete again with the perpetual prisoners or recognize the shadow, wouldn't he invite ridicule? Yeah, ridicule, laughter. Okay, but what's the last line of that paragraph? Wouldn't it be said of him that he returned from his upward journey with his eyesight ruined and that was is it worthwhile when you try and travel upward? Yeah. As for anyone who tried to free them and leave them up there. there. Anyone who tries to free them. In this text, it says the man who tries to free them, right? So it individualizes it where it leaves them open. The translation is ambiguous. I'm deliberately choosing this translation because it makes it more specific that it's not the person being laughed at who's returned to try to compete instead it is the person who's trying to liberate that's going to become more important when we get behind the text by the way what happened to socrates you know do you know what happened to socrates uh did socrates live a long and happy life <laughs> no Athens did not like it. what did they do to him they killed him with poison or something yeah yeah, yeah. so so fine i'm just going to skip to behind the line questions, why this is an illusion. This is Plato alluding to his, you know, the person he had, had most impact on his life, Socrates. And this is an illusion to Socrates being killed, not you, right? The people who wear the t shirts, like Plato's rescue team, they think that they're the ones that are going to get killed, meaning you think you're fucking Socrates and you're not, <laughs> right? I'm not. I'm not, I'm not saying you're not and I am. I'm saying none of us, right? Good luck being Socrates, okay? But that's the pretense of this style, the, the bad style of reading Plato's cave. Um, so who are they going to kill? All right, so let's learn a little bit more about the competition. What, what is that, okay? So if at that time among them there were many honors and praises and prizes for the one person, right, a man, let's just say human, uh, who is sharpest at making out things, right, and remembers them. So you're sitting there chained. And let's, let's actually go all the way back. How are they in chain? They are there 
their whole lives. From childhood, they have been sustained from childhood. Their head is immobile. They can't turn, right? All they see are shadows and hear noises. So it's more an oral culture than it is a the tactile culture, right? They, they don't even know what touch is because they haven't moved their whole life. Now, um, you might not be familiar with this. In the study of Judaism in particular, there's this method of interpretation called midrash, where you put skins on things. So here, this is where we have a blip, but Socrates doesn't explain it and Plato doesn't explain it. How are these people sustained? The only way that we could explain it is there's got to be some sort of technology that keeps them alive and manages their sewage, right? They, they can't be sustained from childhood that whole time. So already we know that there are other characters involved that aren't even mentioned. Or at least the text is ambiguous enough to be open to that contribution on the part of the reader, the active reader, okay? Uh, let's see, another on the lines question. Uh, is it an allegory? The word that he uses for his image, you can see it, uh, that word that's being translated is icon, icon. And that is the opposite of what the prisoners see. The prisoners see what's called acacia or acacia. So acacia versus icon. Socrates is saying this is the icon of the cave but what the people in the cave see, the shadows, but they don't see shadows. They take the shadows as real. So holographic illusions, something like that, that's what they see. And that's acacia. So that's the contrast. Um, so now let's drop the allegory so that we're not worried about how does this correspond to stuff? But we'll come back to that. So any other on the lines questions that I need to, my notes are on my phone so, I, so that you can't see my tricks uh prisoners who's killed okay so what do they do in the cave they have this competition and back to the quotation that we had earlier what we realized is that why are they a source of laughter because they can't compete they can't see that they don't get what's going on they can't answer the questions as fast when they first come down okay so so from my perspective we would say that they appear disabled they appear disabled, right? Both mentally and physically disabled. And let's also look more carefully at where they go. Um, where does this person go? Yeah, right here. Where does this person go when they come back down? Remember that in the video it said they come back down and they're telling other people and then all of a sudden they kill him. But if you look at this line right here, if the man were to come back down again and sit where? In the exact same seat, meaning they're right there. Are they chained up? Are they still free? Uh, the way that I encourage people to think about this is um, like in therapy, sometimes there's toy therapy or play therapy where you take models and dolls. Think of it as like Barbies or, yeah, so the movie reference, okay. But uh, He-Man toys, whatever, G.I. Joe's, whatever, right? And Glaucon and Socrates are sitting there going, okay, picture the cave. Now we got all the people here, we walk the people out and then we put them back. What do you think that person will feel now that they're back in their same spot once they've had this sun moment? I would rather call it a light bulb moment before an aha moment, right? Like a light bulb before the invention of light bulbs. Um, so that's on the lines. Any other on the lines? So just, uh, yeah, there's, there's no indication on the lines that this person is supposed to save others or even explain to them that they're wrong. And in fact, there's another spot where he says, <clears throat> you really shouldn't laugh at people whose eyes are dim, whether they're going out of the cave or coming back down into the cave. 
if you really understood this stuff, you wouldn't laugh at them. Uh, and he says, there's this line where he says, it might be much later, but at a certain point he says, um, we're gonna put the person back down in the cave. And regardless of whether this person thinks that their perspective is correct or not, they need to participate in what's going on in the cave. They have to participate in the com competition. This goes back to the point of the Republic, which is we're trying to educate philosophers so that they can be philosopher kings and queens. They need to rule. They don't get to leave society. They have to stay in it. So the shadow world or the cave world is really society, man. Okay. Um, uh, whereas we as philosophers, you know, professional paid philosophers, not Socrates, uh, we think, right, uh, society's wrong. We don't I, I want to withdraw from society like Thoreau or something. Not, not to be mean to Thoreau. Um, anything else that you think that might be on the line that I might be missing? Is this good enough? Let's go to between the lines. First, who is it that does the dragging? And what I mean is, you remember from the video, the person that shot the arrow to free the person? <coughs> so what happens is that, and if someone dragged him away by force through the steep place, we're not told who this someone is, but like I said, well, ooh, let's not do that yet. What they also do is while they're dragging the person, they'll they'll uh, interrogate them about like, is that a fire? Do you like, right? You're dragging the person out. Why do they need to be dragged out? Because they don't want to go. You turn around and see fire for the first time in your life. This is Neo in, what was it called? Matrix, the Toyota Matrix, okay, right? <laughs> So he turned, right, his eyes hurt, like this is the first time you've ever used your eyes. So it's painful. This person is not like, yes, I can't wait to get out of the cave because I've been manipulated my whole life. You don't want to be, okay. So it's painful. So the video already left out that it's painful and that somebody else is forcing us to do it. So just know that your professors are causing you trauma <laughs> and that's what we call education. <laughs> um, um, dragging you out. And then they say, as we drag them out, let's ask them questions. Uh, and I'm not seeing where that line is. Well, yeah, wouldn't he be at a loss and frustrated by all the questions we ask them? Now in the group translation, it's a little bit better because it says, we ask him these questions. And by we, who's the only we in the dialogue? Socrates talking with Gautron, adding Nicholas and the others. We, Socrates, Glaucon, and so on, are asking the free prisoners. So already the video is highly problematic because it's totally dropped out the dialogical context within which the conversation has even happened. So it's not that there's some other person coming from mysterious nowhere that frees you. It's literally the Socrates and Glaucon just moving the action figures. I mean, that's a simple Um. So the dragger, that, that is a between the lines question because it's not on the lines, like what, who is it? Uh, another between the line question is right away. Here we have Socrates describing the people in chain and then there's these other people carrying all sorts of artifacts. So I would rather call them artifact carriers than puppeteers. Because if you call them puppeteers, you're already starting the manipulation thing. But if you call them artifact carriers, now all of a sudden, they might just be merchants on their way from one city to the next, one house to the next, to sell stuff. And, and that's going to matter in a, in a little bit. Uh, so right here, you have Glaucon saying, that's strange. And it's strange, the prisoners you're talking about. And here's this weird line. Socrates says, they're like us. 
when you watch the video or you see the t-shirt or you look at the memes, it always suggests that all of us or the Democrats are the ones that are in the cave, right? Or all humanity is in the cave and you really need like atheists to save all these religious idiots, right? Like that's how this is characterized. But if we look carefully at like us, who is the us in the dialogue? Again, Socrates, Glaucon, and there's these other people, Thrasymachus, uh, uh, Paul Marcus, Cephalus, basically privileged men with aspirations to politics. And right there, we need to ask ourselves, why are we so gung-ho to identify with those sorts of people? Mm. Do you experience your, that? That's why you kind of ruined my point with the 24-hour thing. That's super privileged, right? To be able to have 24 hours and just be able to talk. How do you make money when you eat? Right? Mm -hmm. I, right. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, how, how, many, how many folks in Gaza are able to have a philosophical conversation right now? Right? Like, that's what I mean. It's privilege. Okay. Um, let's see. So, like us. Who's the us? Uh, one more between the lines question. Uh, ooh, okay, if they have a competition, right? If these people have a competition with first place, second place, last place, um, doesn't it require that they already have mathematics? How could you rank if you don't have mathematics yet? That matters because the next passage of the book is gonna to turn to teaching kids dialectic and that they need to learn math, astronomy, physics to be able to learn dialectic. As if the, the learning these things are what leads us to be philosophers and to be dialectic. Mm -hmm. But people in the cave already know how to do math. They clearly have a language, it might not be a very good language, but they can communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that I think of their language is that um, there's there are uh, there's research about adult people who have been deaf but never learned sign language, but yet they communicate by gesture. They call it echo echo glossolalia is what they call it. So you you gesture your your meanings, and so you don't really understand subject predicate relationships when you mm -hmm. complete thoughts. So how to, to transition from echo glossolalia to thinking in complete thought meaning your, predi your, your predicative apparatus by which you can locate things. So somebody who's left a kid will come back. It's not, what I dislike about the video too is that it says that the sword is more real than shadows as if shadows aren't real, but aren't shadows real? Do shadows not exist? They exist, there's shadows all over the place and it actually leads to texture of our lives, right? Like, oh, that's kind of neat how the sun is shining on your face or whatever, right? Uh, so it's not that the shadows are not real, it's that we don't understand the shadows to be shadows. So when we come back to the cave, we can actually understand shadows as shadows. Okay, so the last between the lines question is the connected connection with the divided line and the connection with the allegory of the sun. But because we haven't read the whole text, it's a little hard, but anyway, let's, let's think about it this way. So the way that most people talk about the divided line is that we are all stuck in the lowest level, which is fantasy. And we can think of it like a ladder. Uh, so it's, it's also like Diotima's ladder from the symposium too. The lowest ladder is, the rung of the ladder is um, fantasy images. The second rung, wait, I already went over the divided line, didn't I? I'm going to detail it briefly, yeah. Okay, okay, not in that detail. You're so, that. yeah, okay. So, the lowest level is images. The second level is things, tangible things that you can touch or trust, is the word they, get, you could, word they use. And then the things you could think, like complete thoughts, they talk about mathematical or geometric proofs, is one of the examples they give. And then the last level is being able to um, perceive the idea of the good or what I would rather call the first principle. Okay. So you can see how we could take that ladder and map it right onto the cave. That's where the alley, that's why we're tempted to call it an allegory, because you could immediately connect the two. But the problem is that 
it makes it seem as if ordinary people are in the cave and philosophers are the ones that leave the cave and come back and rescue ordinary people who aren't philosophical. Mm -hmm. But if we think of the artifact carriers as the ordinary people just doing their job, then we've got to flip it. It's not where do ordinary people sit? They sit on, on the, the line from stuff to thoughts, the, the, the things to thoughts. It's the people with corrupt knowledge that are in the bottom of the cave. Knowledge that has, or education that has gone wrong, like, you know, <clears throat> getting Trump in office. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not supposed to be political, right? We're apolitical. Uh, philosophy is above politics. And, and anyway, why was I talking about that? Oh, so oh, that no. forces us to rethink the divided line because most people want to treat the divided line as everybody starts at the bottom when we're all actually starting at the middle and some of us go well and some of us go wrong. And the going well is actually accessible to the ordinary people, but not accessible to the people who are trapped in the cave. Mm -hmm. Who's trapped in the cave? The people that care about honors and prizes and these sorts of things, first place, or grade grubbing students. <laughs> Uh, but that's, are you really learning if you're only learning for the sake of the grade? No, we all know this. But yet, we know that that's how a lot of people get it done. Uh, or think about people who go into medicine for the money. I do not want that one, that person doing surgery. Okay, so, so, uh, the next step, just, where are we at? That's between the lines, behind the lines. So, We've already kind of started talking about this, like Glaucon. The cave is for Glaucon because Glaucon keeps wanting to <coughs> assimilate all knowledge of the good to what is useful for his position in society, his social plane. So Socrates has got to get Glaucon to stop thinking that way to be able to get him to hear what Socrates is actually trying to communicate with him. So that's behind the lines because I'm trying to get us to understand like the context. And, and so let's think of it on an even broader level. If Plato wrote the book about and for his brothers, what would the Republic look like if he was writing it about and for you? Because if Socrates were to ask you, what is justice? How would you answer? You might have a totally different perspective, in which case, whatever, because part of the Republic is coming up with the ideal city. Maybe your ideal city is not an ideal city at all. It's an ideal Socrates. And you're going to talk about a Socrates or your ideal business or whatever you're kind of leaning towards, right? It could be the World of Warcraft team or something, I don't know, <laughs> right? Uh, but that the conversation would be totally different. And that matters because then we can address a question like, why is the idea of the good so austere in the Republic because Glaucon's like a soldier, but then in the symposium, the good or the beautiful is erotic. And that's because Alcibiades wants to fuck Socrates. Um, so now we have an explanation for, for a different way to approach Plato's differences across dialogues in a way that doesn't lead us to this ideal realm of the forms. Right, I've just switched it to talking about people and different people responding to dialogue in different ways, such that we come to a different understanding. Right, you could have a different twenty-four hour conversation with somebody else, and it still be awesome, and yet not be the same as the other one that you had, and that's not a problem. But yet, for some reason, we want to read Plato and go, "How are his concepts consistent across all the texts?" Instead of how is dialogue consistent across all the texts. Um, I'm, I'm not right. I'm not the only one who thinks of this. I'm getting most of it from God. I'm just stealing from him without crediting him. So you think I'm awesome and not him? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think there's one more, and then I'll be done. Okay. So the the last thing. Where can we go from here? So beyond the lines. Uh, one of my favorite kind of deliberate misreadings of Plato is Luce Irigaray. She's a psychoanalytic philosopher coming out of Freud and Lacan. She has a 200-page mimicry of Plato's cave 
where she's trying to say, this is Plato's uh, patriarchal project to rid himself of the womb of the mother, that the cave is the womb and the son is the Apollonian like patriarchal principle. Now that reading requires the one that we have said is a mystery. For her to be able to pull that off, she has to, she has to assume that what I've been saying is a misreading of the cave is the right reading of the cave. Another reading uh, that Gadamer gives is to say that it leads us to uh, a way of thinking, like I was talking about predicates earlier, that it opens up the capacity for us to think in a way that echoglossolalia doesn't. And then the last thing. Uh, I had a student write a paper on the cave after we kind of talked through it this way, and they took it as kind of a encouragement against voluntourism, like how <coughs> you could uh, think that you need to save people, but instead you actually need to be a participant in that community. Mm -hmm. they're, they're coming at it from a social worker perspective and uh, thinking of ways how they can bring their knowledge to serve rather than to save. And that's the end. Mm -hmm. Almost went the whole time. I'm sorry. Right. Like this whole promotion of dialogue, and then I don't even let you do it. <laughs> we got time. We got 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Questions? Or things we want to bring up? The discussion? Why is it like, did you want to come talk to us about the case instead of a different story from the Republic? Because I just thought of it. Okay. Yeah, like I've been teaching the Republic in an intro to philosophy class. I, I do like a Greek books approach, so I pick like five Greek books for my intro. And so I've been reading the whole Republic with students for like the last five, ten years. And the reason why I say both is because I'm I'm not quite sure when I started. Uh, but but what I noticed is that. When I would come to class, after having read the section on the cave, I would always ask, like, what is the cave about? And someone would volunteer to, like, tell the story <clears throat> of the cave after they have read it. And they would still repeat the, the bootstrap and rescue version, right? Why is the bootstrap and rescue version so ingrained in us when that's not at all, at least, and what I show you, I hope you're convinced that that's not at all what the cave is about. And I've looked back, like even, even Ivan Rush, like in his medieval commentary on it, he, he almost goes the search and rescue path, but it's ambiguous with him. Whereas everybody else since, you know, Descartes, look, I'm blaming Descartes, but, but really I'm blaming liberal ideology and that this is all about uh, rugged individualism. You can save yourself from the cave and when you go try to save other people from the cave, they're going to kill you. Do you think that it, like the inspiration that you're getting from the students at the University of Beaux Arts or like where you've been teaching, but it sounds like it's a, it's a very universal idea. Do you think that it has anything to do with our experiences as people growing up in the South where like that ideology is so prevalent of that like yourself by your bootstraps, that's how you live life. Like, yeah. I all the time for my parents. So I wonder if it would be a different interpretation if you were talking right. about This that. student that I'm talking about, I yeah. think they're from Nicaragua. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, and they're, they're like looking in the future to be somebody who's going to like do social work in Nicaraguan communities yeah. and going, how do I bring my knowledge from the West sure. or from the U.S. without trying to turn them into more U.S. Mm -hmm. acolytes. Sure. Yeah. So I, I think you're right, Horn. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Right. Oh, um, so I know you talked about the implication of like their own sort of like mathematics and like yeah. how they have their own language. So since these people were chained up and really didn't move into our life and they got dragged outside the cave, <clears throat> how, like, how are they going to interact with like outside of the cave right? properly? Right. So, I mean, again, this is the midrash approach where we've got to fill in the lines. How long does it take for them to actually acquire the language of outside the cave? 
they've got to be out there long enough to learn how to communicate with other people outside of the cave to know that's the sun, that's a tree, that's a rock, because they've never been exposed to that stuff before. It's not just immediate, like, oh, this is a rock, how duh. So it's got to be, right, the, the passage has got to have a lot more time so that the person could actually learn, understand language, and then be able to go back down. I think, but it's not there, right? So we got to fill in the gaps for ourselves as what, what would be a plausible explanation. Does that work? Yeah, and I was, was thinking, like, in terms of math, would you think that like, inside the cave and outside the cave have similar ways of thinking through things, like, logically? Right, different, different mathematics. But we could say that they both have logic, mm -hmm. but like the content within that logic is going to be different. Right? So for me, it's like when I learned that 0.9 with a bar over it is equal to one. At that moment, I'm like, math is made up. <laughs> right? How is that possible? But it is. It's not just possible. It's the fact. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think that when I was 12. Uh, yeah, I, I wondered if the text talked about who did the chain or not. Yeah, uh, the text the text just says, imagine there are all these people that have been chained up their whole lives. It doesn't it doesn't say let's chain some people up and experiment. <laughs> that would be interesting though. Yeah, I mean I think we would have to submit an IRB for uh, to follow to follow up on that. that there's a, a study by Hubel and Weissel on kittens. It involves making their heads stay still and they can't move and see what their how their vision develops. Well, I've heard about that with cats. Yeah. I've heard about that with cats where you train them only to see up and down and then they can't see vertical lines. So they can't they can't their their vision is really not mm -hmm. developed well in this critical period of their vision mm -hmm. develops. So that that study is like kind of parallel to this description and it's interesting how the way you put it had to do with movement, right? Yeah. You know, bodily movement. Yeah, and like then, vision yeah. is not merely seen, right? When that's why your eyes are actually stuttering all the time to be able to see lines. I thought I saw another hand. Go for it. I have a question. Have you seen the movie Old Boy? It's a Korean film, and it I it sounds has, familiar. It has a similar like a man. Not like no spoilers, just the premise. A man is like kidnapped out of like I think he's like two or three before he's cognizant. Uh -huh. Kidnapped and held in a room with yeah. nobody to talk to, nothing to just wipe off until he's like fifty. And then he's released like nothing happened. Yeah, I think I know because he's released and then becomes like right? Like isn't he stellar? I haven't seen it. Oh I don't know. I've been wanting to watch it. And now okay. I'm like I wonder. Yeah, well now I want to well, yeah, watch it too. Yeah. I, I assume that he's been trained. To be like an assassin or something like that. It's oh. kind of interesting to think about it in terms of like a feral child narrative and consistent with other kind of feral children. That, that's why I brought up the thing about Echoes Wasalalia because that's a study about uh, Susan Schatz. <laughs> I forget her last name, but she mm -hmm. published a book, A Man Without Words, mm -hmm. where it's not about the feral child, it's an adult that can't speak. And she successfully teaches this guy sign language. And she's able to describe the moment that he understood the difference between mimicry and poiesis, right? Like this movement from mining to understanding complete thoughts and just how he physically changed in this moment. Now, it wasn't like a, a how do you replicate that experiment, right? So on a like research level, it's hard to know, but on a poetic level, it really moved. So I'm thinking about like the differentiation between like assuming that the people by the fire are ordinary and the people in chains are people like with false interpretations and, and that have a pretense to win and lead and rule. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because I don't know if it's I don't think it's talked about like who's chosen to be what. It just is assumed it is. And going back to like what you were saying it does feel like a narrative talking about like development and like also like choicelessness like, that there's no choice mm -hmm. yeah uh and and this is literally what he right like i didn't point out the line but isn't there <laughs> the very first line nature of our, its education is want of education and that 
that we want to make it seem as if we as individuals can choose where we are in the cave. Like I can escape if I realize I'm in the cave, but really it's it's about education impacting us to <laughs> some degree that we can understand what's going on. So. Mm -hmm. I uh oh, go for it. Yeah. Go for it. Go uh, for it. Thank you. Really? Um, Thanks. I you're making me think the thought I've never had before. Which that's uh, not <laughs> not such an issue. But um, <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I, I, you're making me think that the whole story is about how many things. That that at every level, one question is how do I interpret what's happening and what's and even on the you know I love that bit where. See someone you can't understand, you don't know if they're going up or going down that way, right? Yeah. This is all about like how do we learn how to talk to each other? Yeah. And I think that's I think that's provocative. So you you got my secret. That's where I was oh, gonna go. That's very because because I was gonna say, because I was gonna say another element of Glaucon adding into Socrates, they're all literate. Yeah, right. right. So that's we're true. really talking about literate people with a pretense. And so think of the cave wall not as a cave, but as a piece of paper. And the shadows as ink. Yeah. Right? We're going, I can't learn. How do you make sense of this? Well, I know how to read, right? And now I got Chat GPT that can tell me what everything's saying, right? It can just speak without even knowing what it's saying. That's exactly what's happening in the cave. So that, that's exactly the route I'm gonna go if people let me work on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask about the like uh, the way you were talking about the politicians and what their values are and what the contrast is between what's what Plato's trying to talk about what the values are, right? So like this is a book about justice and defining justice. And this is a key moment, right? That is gonna tell us something, chapter seven, yeah, about justice. And like, what is that distinction? Is it like pursuing justice for gain or versus something else? Well, What's the something else? So is it that's that principle thing, right? The first principle or whatever. Like, can you really have an account of justice if you don't have a principled way to like lay it out? But the other approach is the people in the cave are are competing over claiming to know justice when they don't. And so, so um, right, and, and they get rewarded for winning the competition. So that version of justice is corrupted by incentive. Whereas if it's really the ordinary people walking by, that means ordinary people have access to the sun. So to me, I was thinking another element to add to justice would be the common good. Like the idea of the good is not hidden, it's actually the common good that we all have access to, but we just take for granted. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if that could uh, add to your question. I don't. I, I know that it didn't answer your question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, still got two more minutes. Okay. Can we be done? Well, I was. Oh, okay. I, I was wondering if, like, uh, <laughs> I'm just messing around. <laughs> like you, you hinted at there's a possible like kind of disability studies yeah. with this too. It's not just about development, yeah. right? But it's about how it is that you know if you can't walk, then it matters to your to your pursuit and how you understand knowledge. And if you're blinded, then it matters, right? Yeah. And that that even like it's sort of hinting at laughing's not good. Like he's explicit. That, Laughing at this disability is not good. Mm -hmm. So, how does that relate to? Oh, you're at the between the lines questions of the text. Yeah, because because um, uh, he's talking about the education of philosophy. So, so the next thing is the curriculum, and then we get to dialectic, and that's philosophy. But uh, right, like if we say this is how philosophers occur, uh, what about cities? where philosophers emerge coincidentally not by educational design and if, like in the 490 or somewhere he says there's only two ways that somebody can become a philosopher 
in a society that is not properly ordered. And that's through either being possessed by a demon like me, or in other words, a mental disability, mm -hmm. or to have a physical disability like Theogies is the person's name. So, yeah. so, okay. and, and so I say, like, I, I think about this a lot where it's, it's, you're disabled relative to normative society because the cave is normative society, not uh, reality. Or reality proper or something like that. Mm -hmm. So so for me, the it, it, it's coming from Crip's Crip theory. Uh, there's a book by Alison Kafer called uh, Feminist Queer Crip. Mm -hmm. And she talks about how we've kind of inherited two ways to think about disabilities, that either we have the biomedical model where it's a fact that you are disabled because of this disease or whatever, or disabilities are a result of a social construct. The reason why I can't reach the bookshelf is because somebody made it too high, right? The reason why some buildings are inaccessible is because whatever idiot thought that stairs should be prioritized could didn't make ramps instead, right? Like, why didn't we just make ramp entrances to begin with, okay? So, so it's, but her point is that whether it's biologic or whether it's socially constructed, She's, she's saying it's always politically contestable what constitutes disabilities. So now, right, like now with like transgender issues, why is that treated as elective surgery, but then amputation is treated as disability? And why does the ADA recognize only certain things as disabilities, but other things? No, you don't, that doesn't count as a disability. And we're all walking around going, I wear glasses. And I just say, should I count myself? I applied for a job. Do I count myself as disabled or not? I don't know. Because <laughs> it's all loaded. And, and so for me, like the Republic could be flipped to use <coughs> as like a crypt advocacy <laughs> through, that, through that moment where he says the only way to be a philosopher is to be I mean, excluded from the norm, really. So you see things from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And then even this issue with the cave, it brings it right back that it's really about, they're, they're laughing at people who are disabled. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, what else did Trump do on the, if you remember, mm -hmm. do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Do you know what I'm referencing? Probably not. There was this moment where he was given a, a rally talk and there was a reporter who was disabled and Trump just literally was like, ha, 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 look at this guy, right? So, you know, I can imagine Blackheart doing that too, maybe, or, or for me, the real question of the Republic is, would you want Glaucon to run your city after having this nine hour conversation with Sai? <laughs> and if you don't, then you want a different city. But if you're like, no, I think, I think Glaucon is now trustworthy. He wasn't at first. <laughs> But now he's trusted. Well, thanks a million. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys coming out. It was a pleasure to meet you all. Thanks thank you for the conversation. So and uh, hopefully see you around again. You're just down the road. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Next week, we're going to talk about what love is. <laughs> what is love? There's no one presenting. Oh.